Hello, friends, and welcome back to Stories About Entitled People. I'll take people who don't understand how phones work for 800. Did she really think that if you stopped answering the phone, her call would magically be rerouted to Supercuts? But before we begin, best way to support our channel is to leave comments, like, and subscribe at the turned on bell so you don't miss the new video every single day. Here we go. This is a private residence, not Supercuts. This happened many years ago when there was a Supercuts in my hometown. Their phone number and ours were almost exactly alike except their last digit was different from ours. Now ours had the same three digits in a row at the end, think like 333, 777, etc. while theirs was two of the same digits and then a zero, i.e. 330, 770, you get the idea. Which means it was very easy to accidentally dial our number instead of theirs if you were dialing too fast. At the time, answering machines weren't as prevalent as they'd be a few years later, so when I was forced by my parents to answer the phone instead of hello, I used to say, our last name residence. That always seemed to get the people who meant to call Supercuts to realize they dialed the wrong number, and I'd just say, oh yeah, theirs ends in zero. Just dial a little slower. They'd thank me and hang up. My mom, for some reason, though, still insisted on saying hello instead of answering my way, which meant she often got people trying to make appointments for Supercuts. Now, I'd say 99% of the time they'd accept from her. Oh, you've got the wrong number. This is our name residence. They'd apologize and hang up. One time, a kid in the army called because he'd been on leave and needed a haircut before he went back. He was very disappointed he called the wrong number. Now, mom happens to be a retired hairstylist and offered to cut his hair for free. Even told him where we lived and how to get there. I can't remember if he showed up or if he decided to just go to Supercuts instead. But one lady did not get it. She kept calling and calling and calling. Mom was the one who answered the first time and every time after. Then she hung up instantly every single time mom answered the phone and said hello. Finally, after what must have been a good 10 or 15 minutes of calling our house, she yelled at my mom, would you stop picking up the phone? I'm trying to call Supercuts. We got an answering machine not long after and a couple years later, Supercuts shut down that location so we stopped getting calls for them. Hope y'all have a nice, Karen-free day. And our second story. Millions lost over a single flight. I was doing some HR training at work today, and the HR rep told a story which was given as an example of one of the consequences of poor customer service. When my coworker was going to be married, the wedding was out of state so as to be closer to his and the bride's families. One of his friends, who was going to be in attendance, had to fly coast to coast across the U.S. in order to attend. The day of the wedding, his flight was canceled, and the airline refused to rebook him a flight in time. And on top of that, were not at all kind or hospitable. As a result, he missed his good friend's wedding, and this pissed him off. What the airline didn't know was that this particular person worked as a travel agent. His job was to book commercial flights for long groups. This airline was one of the bigger international airlines based in the U.S. and someone he would normally consider when booking flights. However, after this airline refused to rebook his canceled flight and caused him to miss his best friend's wedding, he refused to even consider them as an option for his clients. He was so PO'd by the airline's customer service, he even kept track of how many times he could have booked a flight with them, but instead chose another, perhaps even more expensive option, over the next couple of years, he cost the airline over $2 million in lost revenue because they were rude to him and refused to rebook his flight, causing him to miss his friend's wedding. And our next story. Don't tell me my dog is fat. It was many years ago now that I was a locum veterinarian in a small suburban veterinary clinic. For the most part, the clients were a pleasure to work with, were receptive to the advice and instructions given to them by the staff in regards to their pets, and it generally made my time working there a placid experience. Every rare once in a while, though, a client's account would be flagged as non-compliant. This usually meant a client who didn't follow medication instructions, post-operative procedures, scheduled rechecks, general health advice, and so forth, usually resulting in cases not progressing as well as they should have. Of course, some of these clients would also complain about said poor outcome, and the fault was, of course, never theirs. Enter one particular Miss Noncom. 
Since I was only a part-time locum, working every other weekend at the time at this particular clinic, I seldom saw a client more than once unless they specifically requested to see me again. As such, I'd never met Miss Noncom before, but plastered at the top of her file was the dreaded non-compliant. Miss Noncom owned a Jack Russell Terrier that had an extensive history with the clinic, and as I browsed the history of the patient prior to the consultation to familiarize myself with them, it was painfully obvious that Jack was far too fat to be healthy. In fact, there was enough of Jack to make another Jack with some Jack to spare. Jack was due his annual vaccination and checkup, so I asked them to enter the consultation room, which they did at a leisurely pace due to the fact that Jack was barely able to keep up with Miss Noncom, who was herself not particularly fast due to her own bodily dimensions. It was somewhat apparent why Jack was struggling with weight issues when his own owner was apparently having the same difficulties. Typically, in a situation like this, I would be as careful as I could be not to offend the owner or make any assumptions about their current bodily state, as it's common for large owners to likewise have large pets, and suggestions have to be made appropriately without blatantly putting too much blame on the owner. However, my desire to be tactful went straight out the window when Miss Noncom, with a sour expression on her face, which also appeared to have the remnants of a candy bar smeared on one cheek, heaved her panting Jack onto the table and greeted me with an irritable, Jack needs his needles, and don't tell me my dog is fat. Very well. Jack was only five years old, far too young to be the size he was, though no pet of any age should ever be as fat as he was, and his history had revealed a host of maladies that resulted from his size. Abrasive skin damage of his chest and belly from dragging on the ground, skin fold dermatitis, recurrent yeast infections of his ear canals that were squeezed shut by a neck that was no longer a neck, but merely a globular extension of his thorax, degenerative joint disease, upper airway disease, the list went on. Now, unfortunately, one shortcoming of the clinic I worked at was the senior veterinarian there who owned the practice was a very senior fellow indeed who had long lost his passion for the job and seemed to be content to just let things slide with the more difficult clients, treating the patient symptomatically rather than addressing the underlying problem. I decided that now was the time to assert my new blood. I have a habit that as I gather the history of a patient from the last time they were seen, I dictate it to myself as I type it into the history of the file. This gives the client a chance to correct anything I may have misheard or add something they remember as I repeat it. And thus I did with Jack, complying with Miss Noncom's desire that I do not tell her that her dog was fat. The patient at presentation of the consultation is morbidly obese and at weigh-in is half a kilo heavier than at last consultation, presenting with moderate to severe dyspnea, likely complicated by excess adipose tissue deposition in and around the thorax. I looked up from my typing. How much are you feeding Jack these days? Miss Noncom shot me a poisonous look, but perhaps because she hadn't met me before and thought perhaps I hadn't quite heard her entering remark, responded, he's getting two meals a day. What you recommended last time I was here. Should all be in your records there. It certainly was. The amount recommended should have been fine to encourage weight loss, even in the face of limited exercise, so I forged on with my history, writing, patient is consuming recommended diet, but has failed to shed any excess body mass since last seen five months ago. Another sideways glance from Miss Noncon, and this time her cheeks flushed a little. I proceeded with the physical exam of the patient, and with each problem I noted as a result of his being overweight, I used a different synonym. Hefty, rotund, enlarged, bloated, and a variety of other fat but not fat words were used as I typed up the findings, and in my peripheral vision I could see Miss Noncom's complexion slowly turn from pink to tomato to beetroot. It was when I reached the point of Jack carrying a lot of weight to the opera that she exploded. How dare you! I told you not to tell me he's fat. There's nothing I can do about it, so stop telling me. I mustered my most pained look I could manage, but ma'am, I never once used the word you explicitly told me not to use. And as for there being nothing that can be done, the history states you've refused testing to determine if he has thyroid, adrenal, or other diseases that may be complicating his weight loss. This really isn't in his best interests. If money's an issue, we do have payment plans that can help spread out the cost of such testing. 
I didn't get a finish, as Miss Noncom scooped Jack off the table, berating me and the entire staff of the clinic as she rumbled her person out of the clinic as fast as she could, and swearing that my boss would hear about this. No sooner had the door shut, I heard the nursing staff burst out giggling, and my boss poked his head out of the adjoining consult room, where I'm sure he heard the entire exchange. He simply sighed, shrugged, and said, well, I didn't hear you say the word fat once before closing the door. I later learned that Miss Noncom had returned the following week when I was not present, and not only had Jack vaccinated after complaining to my boss, but also conceded to having blood work done, which revealed an underactive thyroid. Jack was subsequently started on thyroid supplementation, and by the following year he was much healthier and appropriate weight. How could anyone watch their pet struggle to move and refuse to do anything about it? This is disgusting. And people like this should be blacklisted from having pets. An animal's a companion and a family member, not something to be dragged around like a purse. And our last story. HOA towing. In my condo complex as a homeowner in Florida, I parked my car in a lot on the property by the pool alongside about eight other cars around 9 p.m. at night. I have multiple cars, so two are in my driveway, and I needed an extra spot for the car for a few days. Ten days later, my car's missing. I called the HOA, and they said they had it towed for overnight parking in a pool area. I was confused because many cars park there overnight, and there's nothing in the bylaws against that. I called the towing company, and they said the same thing. I said there was no rule, and they said they would call me back. Then they said they remembered that my car was actually towed because it was considered an abandoned vehicle for having all four tires flat. I then stated, how would I have driven it into the spot in that case? The towing company then hung up and called me back saying only one tire was flat and the HOA declared it abandoned. I had to pay $575 to get it back and they stated they would email me with my receipt photo evidence of my tire being flat. It was not flat when I left it there. The towing company did not send me any receipt or photo and will hang up when I try to call them. My HOA will not reimburse me. My credit card company can't help since I don't have a receipt. The CC transaction is not a receipt legally. The cops cannot help since they consider it a civil matter. I decided to take both the HOA and the tow truck company to court with a small claim and let the court figure out who owes me a refund. In the bylaws, it states the common area may be enjoyed by all HOA members and guests, and there's nothing about abandoned vehicles stated. Also, to add icing on top, three months after this incident, they placed signs all around the parking lot saying, no overnight parking, which makes me think they knew what they did was wrong. Towing's among the shadiest businesses in existence, and towing off private property is even worse. One step below organized crime. My hackles were up the second the towing company claimed four flat tires abandoned. Hey guys, thank you all for watching the video. I'll see you in the next one.